decided to bring out Meng Chang. Meng is the president of Purdue University uh, and also a professor of electrical and computer engineering. He was previously the dean of the College of Engineering and growing it to be the largest top 10 uh, undergraduate engineering college in the country. And under his leadership, applicant numbers, selectivity, yield rate and graduation rate, as well as women and minority enrollment percentages all achieve new records. Uh, so we're really excited to have him here. And he also grew the online program size to more than 4x uh, its previous size. Uh, and he's going to give a little talk. And then he's going to bring out Kevin Zhang, uh, a principal at GSV Ventures, for a talk as well. Uh, so first, we'd like to welcome President Meng Cheng to stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So greetings from West Lafayette, Indiana. Well, how many Boilermakers are here? Boiler up. Well, it's a delight to be here. Always fabulous to be at the ASU GSV Summit. And thank you, Deborah, for inviting me to be out here. This is a month four of my new job. So um, I'm still enjoying honeymoon. <laughs> and I just got back from Washington, DC, where, uh, where we had a summit with Secretary Gina Raimondo and Senator Todd Young to talk about universities' roles in CHIPS and Science Act of 2022. So let's see where we are on the slides. I want to show you a picture. I think that picture was missing. What we're supposed to see is that is that my predecessor, Mitch Daniels, sitting in the middle. So use your imagination now. And, and he's flanked on one side by Secretary Romando, on the other side by Secretary Blinken. And then there's Governor Holcomb of Indiana, Senator Todd Young as well. And that was seven months ago at Purdue campus. And we talked about the just signed Science and CHIPS Act. And yesterday we talked about execution. And people ask, what is the role of a university in executing this CHIPS and Science Act? Two answers, one is workforce, and the other is innovation. This is a slide bragging about Purdue, Purdue Engineering in particular, but there is a message at the end, and that is excellence at scale. Over the past number of years, as you can see, the number of engineering students at Purdue University continued to rise. Now there's almost 16,000 students in just one college, engineering. And at the same time, our rankings continued to also go up. And our graduate ranking is number four in the US. Our undergrad ranking remained in top 10, its largest top 10 engineering college. What I'm trying to brag about here is not the numbers, is that there is a notion that you have to be exclusive in order to achieve excellence in higher education. And you don't have to do that. You do not have to sacrifice the scale of the number of students to serve, such as a public land grant institution like Purdue, and you can still grow bigger and better at the same time. And that's why we need the workforce equation here. Folks have underestimated how many semiconductor technicians and engineers we need in order to implement the CHIPS Act. Some say 50,000, some say 100,000 new engineers are needed in this country this decade alone. Where are they going to come from? And that's why Purdue launched the Semiconductor Degrees Program less than a year ago with a precise notion that we need to train a lot more of these chips technicians, engineers, scientists, and economists. So we put together a group of industry CEOs endorsement and CTOs representation on the advisory leadership board. More than 25 companies in the industry are working with us to define and to design the curriculum. And now you can take this set of degrees. I'm not here to sell Purdue degrees to you. Although if you would like to do it, you can do that at the bachelor level, master level, PhD level. You can actually do it at the associate degree level. We formed a partnership to scale this excellence even further with Ivy Tech Community College in Indiana. 
You can do that online. I'll say a word about online at the end. You can do that also in person, of course. And what's interesting is that we've got a national consortium called SCALE that would allow 17 other universities to borrow each other's curriculum. And that's the way to scale it even further. So if you look at this SDP here, along with the national consortium, along with online opportunities, and then finally with NanoHub, which is an NSF-funded online partnership and scientific simulation platform. That's the way you can scale from educating 10 to 100 to 1,000 to perhaps 10,000 this decade. That's too much engineering for me to remember. So I'm going to show you this map that indeed is not just on the coast. I know I am on the west coast today. I was on the east coast yesterday. But in between, there's a lot of talents. And companies would like to go to where the talents are. And that's why what we call the Silicon Heartland. And Purdue is at the heart of that Silicon Heartland. Now part of that is facilities. And people wonder, where will the students be? And the fun story here, that's my second perhaps message beyond bragging about my university, is that you can co-locate research facilities with education facilities, with industry facilities. So just last Friday, Purdue's Board of Trustees announced a $100 million investment to update and expand the Burke Nanotechnology Center's clean rooms so that these semiconductor chip manufacturers can pick up the latest in this new clean room. What is more is that if a student, let's say she wakes up in the morning, turn right to this updated facility so that she can learn with hands-on experience. She could actually also turn left and go work as an intern at a major semi-company called Skywater Technologies. So last summer, Skywater Technologies announced it's going to build a $2 billion fab on Purdue's campus. Now you may say, well, we know the fabs these days are $10, $20 billion apiece. So $2 billion is nothing. Well, it is smaller, perhaps. However, it is located on a university campus. So for a student, it's within a walking distance between her dorm, her classroom, and her intern. And what we believe is that co-locating jobs and workforce and knowledge together is the key to the future of excellence at scale. So think about these three things together. Without jobs, the workforce is not going to stay. Without the workforce, the jobs may not come. And then ultimately, without the knowledge and innovation, that's the second key word from yesterday's conversation with Secretary Romano, Senator Young, is that without innovation, you cannot sustain excellence. For example, in semiconductors, something called advanced packaging is going to change the cost equation and introduce higher profit margin products. That's the only way for the US to sustain its innovative edge. So when you have research professors and students taking the courses and the industry working together, then you can create jobs and knowledge and workforce together. Now, some people say that workforce is not a good word. It's a bad word. It makes it sound like higher education is vocational training. And that's not how we think about it at a place like Purdue. Now, we believe that the real workforce that you would like to have go through a curiosity-driven educational process. It's less about how much you cover. It's more about how much you uncover along with your fellow students about yourselves and the world around you. In that sense, we're training the workforce of tomorrow who can keep on learning, possibly through online, in order to be the actual workforce that can sustain, just like innovation. So this is the picture when Skywater announced that they're going to build the fab on our campus. And it's interesting if you ask them, why did you pick a university campus to build the fab? And their first order answer is actually, because of the talents. Because I want to recruit the students when they are still undergrads, when they are still learning. And then once they intern with us, maybe one day they will decide to join us permanently. And then there's the innovation and partnership 
with professors as well. Now, this actually shows a promising sign. What you see there is Professor Mark Lundstrom, Purdue's Chief Semiconductor Officer. And this is the Jobs Fair. Once a year, Purdue hosts one of the largest student-run job fairs in the country. It happens to be the day that Blink and Romando visited as well. So the, for the first time, we had actually a semiconductor evening. Most of the time, they would like to work at a company such as, say, Facebook or Google and be a programmer. And now they realize that all the computing, all the AI, and later we'll talk about physical AI, all of that happens in some kind of a semiconductor chip. So we thought there may be 50 students interested in making stuff. It turns out that well over 600 students signed up. And they sign up because they understand that jobs and knowledge and workforce go together. And the magnitude, the faces of these students is a reflection of the spirit of excellence at scale of places like Purdue will continue to uphold. So that's enough commercial about my employer. I believe it's time to uh, have a conversation with Kevin. Kevin and I shared a few years together at Princeton, my former employer. And where is Kevin? Let's uh, give a warm welcome to Kevin from TSV. Mung, it's great to be here with you, and congrats on becoming the president of Purdue University. You. you chose a interesting time to become president of university with all the shifts happening in technology and AI, which we have talked quite a bit about during this conference. How has the onset of artificial intelligence and all this innovation changed how you think about your strategy as president of Purdue? Well, Kevin. We didn't get the chance last 10 minutes to talk about AI, but clearly that is the hottest subject in education these days. And there are at least, uh, I guess, two different variants. One is, uh, how do we teach AI? And the other is, how will AI change the way we teach and learn? The sort of, uh, of AI, by AI, well, one day when there's only AI, no human being will be for AI as well. But in the meantime, a place like uh, uh, Purdue, where there's a heavy duty STEM concentration. Frankly, among the AAU universities today, Purdue is the largest undergrad STEM enrollment. Uh, I'll be happy to point out, I know you're a philosophy major, that our philosophy department actually just launched an AI degree. Wow. Right, to talk about ethics, to talk about the limit of AI. Can AI cry and love and dream and they also take some programming classes, as you did, along the way. So how we teach AI, I think, is not just about STEM. It's truly across the whole university. We have applications of AI in physical AI, meaning where the atoms and the bytes meet, the virtual and the physical meet. And that's our unique minor degree in physical AI, where we grow stuff, make stuff, move stuff. What's the implication of AI to those fields? Now, uh, the way that one can teach and learn any subjects doesn't have to be AI. It could be, say, uh, semiconductor physics. I also believe that AI is to be embraced. Let's not stop, because how would you enforce a stoppage on AI? Would you enforce a stoppage on any mathematical studies? You know, my former advisor at Stanford, he worked on, he didn't know it would be called AI one day. So how do we stop research? And furthermore, um, why can't we just try to teach and learn in a new way so that what is still uniquely human-capable activities can take center stage and let's enhance efficiency by giving some of the other stuff to AI? Right, and, and the other big shift happening right now too is this, and your time has been, and we, you talked about a bit with uh, being in DC, is a CHIPS Act and this new focus of our country to uh, do more in research and manufacturing in the states. What do you think is the role of universities in the CHIPS Act and, and these initiatives? Well, again, those two words, workforce and innovation, right? Uh, without the workforce, it is impossible. Tens of billions of tax dollars, hundreds of billions of private investments are going to be deployed in the coming years in the United States alone. But somebody is going to be working 
in those manufacturing and packaging sites. And we need them fast. The other key element is innovation. I always say that when engineers rewrite the economic equations, that's when you know that you are moving the needle. You are not just saying, given the same cost equation and the profit equation, what can we do? Well, you're going to optimize not within those equations, but you're going to do the fundamental research, say advanced packaging, heterogeneous integration, 3D packaging, so that you can transform and rewrite economic boundary conditions. Yeah, and as you think about that and, and, and jobs and workforce, I, I love that. At, at GSV, we are uh, firm believers in the power of bridging the gap between universities and employers um, to, to think about lifelong skilling and reskilling. You know, what is the right way in which universities and companies, I saw the amazing uh, group of logos you had on, on the slide there, what is, how is the best way, how do you recommend universities and workforce, how do you think they can best work together to uh, support students going forward? A part of that is scholarship. You know, Eli Lilly recently is not in semiconductor, it's in pharmaceutical space, but Eli Lilly in Indiana launched a major 40 plus million dollar scholarship program so that the students, even in high school, will be matched to the Lilly Scholarship Program. Part of that is internship, hands-on learning, not just in summer, but throughout the entire academic year, which means you need the facility to be co-located with the student dorms and with the teaching laboratories. And then part of it is just helping us to design the curriculum in a that way that reflects the state of the art so that it's not just professors teaching what they would like to teach. Part of the fundamentals must be taught all the time, but it's to be giving us the external advice to keep updating the curriculum to reflect what the industry is actually doing today. It's, um, it's really cool for me to be with you here having this conversation um, because when I think about your story, it reminds me of my parents. Um, you know, I love what you said earlier about how Purdue is an institution that's not about exclusivity, it's about delivering, learning at scale. And my parents had a chance to come to this country because they had a scholarship and a, got a master's degree from an institution just like Purdue. Um, and, and I love that as, as, as you think about your, uh, your legacy at Purdue. You are, you are uh, filling the shoes of a incredible uh, previous president and President Daniels. Um, and we talk a lot about the Daniels decade and the provocative things he did like freezing tuition, like uh, acquiring Kaplan University, expanding to Indianapolis. Um, I'd love to hear in our last few minutes here, what do you want the chain decade to be about? What do, what do you, what, what's the legacy that you hope to leave at Purdue? Well, I hope it's uh, not uh, being implied by your question that I'm gonna step down anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> I'm just getting used to uh, watching basketballs nonstop. Uh, in the Mackey Arena, not just on TV, and we had a pretty good season. Pretty good season. Until it yes. wasn't a good season, okay. but the next one would be even better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and well, let's talk about um, a couple of things you highlighted. One is tuition freeze. Mm -hmm. you know, as Mitch being a visionary transformational leader, the first thing transformational that he did was this tuition freeze. And one didn't think it could last, maybe it's a one year. He didn't think as he said many times. Uh, but uh, two months ago, Purdue's Board of Trustees just endorsed our proposal for the 12th straight year of tuition freeze. So. Amazing. Thank you. I was hoping somebody is gonna start clapping. Uh, <laughs> now, to many families, whether they're in Indiana or from anywhere else, uh, tuition freeze actually means a lot. It is financially meaningful, but also it's symbolically meaningful. It's a value statement to say there are different kinds of universities, right? Princeton is one kind of university, for example, and it's doing a lot in financial aid, right? But uh, it's a private university. And then there are public universities uh, who's supposed to, in the DNA, be broadening and democratizing access to education is all about student access and success, residential and online. We'll come back to online in a minute. So uh, when Purdue started doing that, people asked, so how is that even possible financially? Well, as Mitch would say, that it's, it's an equation. You set the right-hand side to be zero, and you solve for the left-hand side. Uh, 
So that must be a Mitch fan right there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, there's another nerdy visualization. If you don't like equations, if you like, uh, say, graphs, let's say a two-dimensional chart on the axis is, uh, is a scale, say, measured by the enrollment number at undergrad level. The y-axis is some measure of excellence, whatever you use, ranking, research production, impact, number of patents, quality of students. So you can measure the y, and then you think that there is a trade-off that is going to be bending over pretty bad. If you go bigger, it must get worse. And if you want to get better, the only way is you move towards the origin of this two-dimensional graph. Right? So being a nerdy engineer, I keep thinking about this visualization. And the question is, the question is, when there are too many dishes have been broken, is, <laughs> see, this is how revolutionary this chart is. <laughs> uh, is. Is it possible to actually have both? To go farther on the x-axis and farther on the y-axis at the same time without having to give up any one of the axes? It's not easy, just like tuition freeze is not easy. It requires creativity, requires uh, a lot of dedicated effort by the whole team. But I think uh, Purdue has demonstrated that that is possible, both that equation and that 2D chart. Now, the other topic you highlighted is online learning. So the board actually also just reaffirmed Purdue's online learning 2.0. And there's, I think, a message before time is up for far broader and wider than Purdue. And the 2.0 says that we have two branches. One is Purdue Global as an independent campus, reaching out to those primarily without a bachelor degree. And the other is Purdue University Online, which takes the West Lafayette main campus courses into working professionals. So collectively, you can have a continuum of growth with quality, with integrated, innovative, and trusted delivery across the entire population. Perhaps that would be my sort of departing message, is that excellence at scale. There is the entire market, and if you do it right, you should be able to cover it all. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. <laughs>